All right, everybody, let's get this show started. Let's rock and roll with the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Good afternoon, folks. Glad you're here. Welcome to the show. It's the Lunchtime Discovery Series brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and organized by the folks over at the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. Uh, as always, Wednesdays at noon, we gather here at the museum's YouTube channel to meet interesting people doing interesting things out there in the worlds of science and nature and more. And today, like always, we've got a fantastic show for you. Uh, one I'm very excited about. I have to say some of my favorite lunchtime discovery series talks are topics that I have to admit I know very, very, very little about. Uh, and today with geology, I'd have to say uh, I can certainly point out a rock to you, but I don't think I could tell you much about those rocks, uh, whether they're big rocks or little rocks. I could probably work that out, uh, but that's about the extent of my knowledge. I know a little bit about rock music. That's not why y'all are here. You're here to learn about North Carolina's geology, at least a little bit more about it. And today's special guest on the program is going to do just that for us. Everybody, I want you to meet Amy Pitts. Amy is the Senior Geologist for Education and Outreach with the North Carolina Geological Survey, which, as I understand it, has also been celebrating an anniversary of late. Everybody, welcome Amy to the show. Hi, Amy. Hi, Chris. Thanks. Thanks so much. Yes, we are celebrating our 200th anniversary this year. So let me pull up my screen and get this started. Okay. Hi, everybody. Yes, my name is Amy Pitts. I am a geologist. I work for the North Carolina Geological Survey. We're part of DEQ. This year, we are celebrating a very special anniversary, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But we're going to spend the better part of the next hour or so, hopefully a little less. I tend to talk a lot. But we're going to talk about some of the geologic history of North Carolina. We're going to talk about some of the, the geologic formations and how they got there and why they're so special. I do consider myself a bit of a storyteller, so I don't want to give you the ending before I give you the beginning. So rather than just saying, hey, look at Pilot Mountain, it is a sedimentary rock or an igneous rock or a metamorphic rock. I'd rather tell you the story of how it got there because I think it makes it that much more interesting. What? Why? Oh, there we go. Okay, so um, because I do education and outreach, one of the main questions that I get all the time, because we are the geological survey, is what kind of survey are you doing today? <laughs> um, people tend to hesitate when they see the word survey because they don't want to give out any um, identifying information. So I always have to tell them, well, it's a rock survey, but I'm not actually doing a survey. I work for the survey. So this is a really weird one. The geological survey started out as a verb. Um, it changed into a noun that still does the verby stuff. So I just want to explain what that means. So the man that you're seeing on your screen, Mr. Dennison Olmsted, he was a um, professor at UNC Chapel Hill. And he kept proposing this idea um, of doing some sort of geological or and mineralogical survey of North Carolina. This was in the early 1820s and he kept getting denied. He kept, they kept saying no, but um, he was persistent. And I guess that paid off because back in, on December 31st, 1823, which is coming up here on 200 years, um, he finally, they approved an act, the legislature, legislator, legislature approved an act. And I'm gonna read from my notes. It was to um, conduct a geological and mineralogical survey of North Carolina. So it tasks the Board of Agriculture with, I like this quote, so I'm going to read it to you, to employ some person of competent skill and science to commence and carry on a geological and mineralogical survey of the various regions of the state. So Mr. Olmsted here was chosen, and I like to laugh because apparently he was some person of competent skill and science in order to do this. So um, they gave him a $250 salary, and he actually traveled the entire state from mountains to coast on a horse. <laughs> and he surveyed the rocks, the minerals, the resources, the gold, all kinds of things of our state. And he actually made the map that you're seeing on your screen. And this was, we th we believe this is the first state individual state geologic map ever produced in the whole country in 1825. He hand drew it. You can see it's in color. There's some red and you can see some other color inks there. It still survives. It's in the, um, the Raleigh art or the 
North Carolina archives in Raleigh. And after this map was produced in 1825, he resigned from teaching at UNC. He went to Yale. And I would have probably done the same thing if somebody made me ride on a horse for a year across the state, I probably would have retired too. <laughs> so after um, he retired, um, somebody else kind of took over this verb, this surveying of our state. And that was Elijah Mitchell and Mount Mitchell fame, Mr. Mitchell there. He took over after a few more years, it, you know, he did some surveying and produced some reports and then it just kind of fizzled out because he thought the legislature and the Treasury Department really wasn't interested in what he was producing. So the survey kind of the verb of the survey kind of went away. Um, but then there was a renewed interest in our resources because of the Civil War, um, the Industrial Revolution. And of course, we needed metals. And currently we're in another revolution, which is the technological revolution. So there's there's been these waves of interest um, in the resources of the state. So now here we are two, 200 years later. We're still we're, we're a noun. We are the North Carolina Geological Survey that still does the verby stuff of surveying. Um, and so here we are, we still produce the resources of our state. And I have to say in the past 200 years of the survey existing, I feel like I have the best job of them all because I love my job. I get to do this this kind of thing all the time. I visit classrooms and talk to people about geology and it's, it's just so much fun. So this is my prologue to what we're gonna talk about today. So uh, I'm going to tell you a story of North Carolina, but we need a prologue. Like, where are we at? Of course, North Carolina is beautiful. We have mountains, we have rivers, we have oceans, we have rocks. But all of these things got here because of geology. And um, it, it's a pretty tumultuous history because all of these things that are created tell us that somewhere along the line, we had some some pretty active geology going on here. We had volcanoes and earthquakes and continental collisions and, and all kinds of stuff. So it's really like a big puzzle. And the puzzle of North Carolina is millions to billions of years old. And imagine that somebody comes along and takes that beautiful puzzle and they rip it up and they tear it and they might burn it, they fold it and they tell you, hey, put this back together. That's the geologic history of North Carolina. That's what a ge that's what we do at the survey. We try to take these puzzle pieces that have been mutilated, basically, and put them back together to find out what was happening in North Carolina in the past. Because knowing what happened in the past can tell us what's currently happening, and, and we, it can help us predict what's going to happen in the future. What kind of resources do these processes give us? Are there any hazards associated with it? And so there are a few constants all the time in geology or science, um, the earth, earth is constantly changing. Its surface is constantly changing. We're gonna talk about that. Things that go up like mountains have to come down through erosion and, and, and weathering. Um, we're always gonna have wind and waves and ice and snow and hurricanes and all these things that act upon the geology of the state to keep it changing and keep it moving. So keep an eye out for some of these themes that we're gonna talk about today because they're not just important for us as geologists, but they're important for you as well, because all these processes and the rock cycle and the recycling of oceans and continents, they help regulate things like the carbon cycle, the water cycle, the rock cycle, our climate and things like that. So um, it's not just important for us. I think it's important for everybody to know a little bit about what has happened in our past. So here we go, let's start our story, North Carolina's geological history. Um, this little cute dog here will make a whole lot more sense in just a few minutes. So let's get, let's get started. Oh, before I start that, I just wanted to point something out. So these uh, upcoming slides that we're gonna talk about, we're focusing on North Carolina and what would become North Carolina. So there's a lot of stuff happening around the rest of the earth. We'll leave that for another day. We're gonna focus on North Carolina. The other thing is we're talking about events that happened billions to millions of years ago. And so, you know, trying to get 10 geologists to agree on a date or any sort of information is pretty difficult. So I'm here to give you the 50,000 foot overview of what, what is happening. There are geologists that spend their entire careers studying one piece of that puzzle. I'm not an expert. Um, I'd like to think I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. I have to take this information that the survey produces, and which is in a language of geology, and I have to kind of 
translate that to a language that everybody can understand. So they, everybody knows why what we're doing here at the survey is important. All right, so let's move on. Let's start our geologic journey. So the next couple of slides that I'm gonna show you, I just want you to be aware of the yellow star. The yellow star is gonna represent where North Carolina either currently is or where it existed in the past or even before North Carolina existed, where it would have been on earth. So what you're looking at here is a map of plate tectonics. So the earth is divided into all these plates and it's the crust of the earth. I like to think of the crust of the earth like an orange. So the peel of the orange, it's thick enough to be protective, but it can also be broken. But the bulk of the orange is underneath that peel on the inside, and that's just like Earth. Our crust is thick enough to be protective, but it's also broken up into all these pieces, but it's really holding in, in what's inside the Earth. And so these plates, um, you can see that there's there's boundaries. The lines on the screen show boundaries between plates. This one is the North American plate where we reside right here. South America, the Pacific plate, there's all these plates. And um, previously in the past, people used the term continental drift. They thought the continents moved around Earth because we have evidence that continents have been in different places at different periods in geologic history. But that's just not the case. It's not actual continents that are moving. It's the plates that are moving. And the plates can move in several different ways. They interact at their boundaries. And that's going to become an important part of our story. But they interact at their boundaries. And sometimes those interactions mean that the plates converge on each other at a convergent boundary. They come together. That usually produces mountains, a lot of times volcanoes and earthquakes as well. Sometimes those plates move apart from each other, which we call divergence. That's also going to play a big part in our story today. And then sometimes the plates kind of interact with each other, moving side by side. And we don't have a whole lot of that that we're going to talk about today, but everybody's familiar with the San Andreas Fault out in California, and that's a place where the plates might slide past each other. Okay, so we currently, are, you can see where the yellow star is. North Carolina is kind of sitting pretty. We're in the middle of a plate. We're nowhere near a boundary, which means we don't have active volcanoes. We don't have large active earthquakes. Um, but yet we still have evidence of all this stuff happening. We have volcanic rocks here. We have old faults and folds in the rocks that signify to us that we were at once near a plate boundary. So let's take a look. All right, so I'm going to introduce a couple concepts here and a couple terms because you're going to see these a few times in the next couple of slides. So I just want you to understand what we're talking about. The first word is orogeny. That is simply a geologic way to say a mountain building event. So usually when plates come together and converge, it creates a mountain. So an orogeny is just mountain building. And of course, you can see at the bottom of your screen, the orogenic belts, that just means a mountain chain. Geologists always have to have a way to, different way to say different words. Um, and then we have cratons. Cratons, you can see is like that khaki color of the continents on the map. Um, cratons are, you can think of those as like first generation continents. So as Earth was cooling billions of years ago and the rocks finally started to solidify, um, they eventually be, got big enough to become continents. So cratons are kind of like that, that first generation continents. I'm going to point out Laurentia because Laurentia is first generation would become North America. So you can see where the yellow star is. North Carolina does not exist yet because we're talking about a billion years ago. But this is where we would eventually be. Laurentia is mostly Canada for the most part, not all, but mostly Canada. Some of the oldest rocks on earth exist near the Hudson Bay in Canada. Um, in fact, the oldest rocks um, that exist in North Carolina from Roan Mountain over near the Tennessee border, um, it's believed that it is part of Laurentia, the original continent. Okay, so what happened during this Grenville orogeny, the Grenville mountain building event about a billion years ago? Well, convergent plate boundaries. The earth was full of plates that were moving together. The result was this supercontinent that we know as Rodinia, but the other outcome was mountains. And you can see the green area areas on this map represent mountains. So the land that would become North Carolina eventually in millions of years um, was the site of a, a mountain building event and they're called the Grenville Mountains. These mountains were really tall. Um, 
Laurentia got crunched and it got deformed during this mountain building event. But um, the mountains here would have been like Himalaya scale mountains, like 25,000 plus feet high. So this was a big mountain building event. And again, we're talking about about a billion years ago. So let's fast forward. Geologists think like this. They start in the past and they move to the present. So we're starting in the past in this story. We're going to move to the present. So the next chapter in this story is that supercontinent, Rodinia, breaking up. So things that come together usually break up. Um, Rodinia broke up. And we kind of... It kind of sat for about two million years, really, before this rifting event happened. And rifting is a new term, which I'm going to explain. Rifting just means these plates are moving apart. So converging, they come together, they build mountains. When plates move apart and diverge, usually the outcome is an ocean. And you can see, again, on your screen, the yellow star kind of represents where North Carolina would eventually be. We don't exist yet. The rocks that became North Carolina still don't exist. But you can see this new word here called the Iapetus Ocean. So I'm going to skip ahead to a screen and then I'm going to come back to this one because I'd like to explain to you exactly what happens during rifting. OK, I'm going to start by telling you this. Everybody knows this. Hot stuff is buoyant. Hot water, hot air and hot rocks are buoyant. They like to move up. So magma, which is just melted hot rocks, like 2000 degree temperature rocks. They're buoyant. They want to get from the mantle, the core mantle. They want to get up towards our crust where those plates are. So they make their way up. And when they get up to the to the crust, they have nowhere else to go if there's no cracks in the rocks. So what they do is they kind of move in this convection current. They cool and they move back down, just like air currents do. It's exactly the same thing. It's a it's a buoyant liquid. Well, when it makes its way up towards the crust, the crust thins and it starts to spread and it moves like this. And you can imagine you have this, you know, crust of the earth that's thinning and spreading. And as it does, it starts to drop down because there's nothing below it to support it. And you can kind of see that progress over here on the image on the right. You can see the magma coming up. You can see the, the plates separating. Now, there are two different ways that this can go. Sometimes that separation of the crust is complete. The plates completely separate. Water pours in. And voila, you have a new ocean, just like the Iapetus Ocean that we saw on the previous screen. Sometimes the plates, they thin and they spread enough and they drop down into these basins, but they don't quite completely separate. We call it failing. They failed. They, they failed their test to rift. But what happens is usually those are on continents. So we, can, we see these rift valleys or rift basins all along the east coast of what is now North America. And what happens, You, I mean, this kind of intuitively, intuitively makes sense. You have now have this new basin or this new valley. Streams and rivers, you know, come in there and they fill it up with sediment and all this stuff that the rivers and streams are carrying from mountains. And it fills up the basin. And I'm going to go back to this screen here to show you what was happening is the those mountains that were created, those Grenville mountains, well, they started eroding. And all of a sudden, you know, we have this these new rifts happening, the Iapetus Ocean forms, and some of those failed rift basins get filled up with sediment, and that creates sedimentary rocks. And that's going to be important in a few slides. Remember this because we're going to talk about Grandfather Mountain. Okay, so um, a, a few million years in geologic time, that's not a whole lot. A few million years passes, and it's relative calm on the planet. I mean... Laurentia is just kind of hanging out. There's not a lot of active rifting or collisions going on. We have the Laurentia has beaches just like we have today. It was just kind of hanging out. But then, um, you know, I have this arrow pointing out to this little feature out here that's going to play a big role in North Carolina's history. But the sands that were accumulating on the beaches of Laurentia, this also, I mean, this is crazy. It plays a another big role in North Carolina's history. This sand is eventually going to become rocks. And we're going to talk about that again when we get to Linville Falls and Pilot Mountain. So keep this, this image in mind. So what was happening during this time, 565 million years to about 500 million years ago during this calm period? Well, there was volcanoes forming out in the Iapetus Ocean. And these volcanoes 
went through periods of erupting and erosion and erupting and erosion, but they were also moving towards Laurentia. So stay tuned because that's going to be a big key factor in the formation of North Carolina. And I just wanted to point out an interesting uh, fact about this picture. I took this picture. I was on the, uh, the island of Antigua in the Caribbean. And that actually is a volcanic island out there. <laughs> I mean, what are the chances? I, I happened to take a picture. That's Montserrat. They had a pretty big volcanic eruption back in 1995. It like buried the capital of the island. But I mean, what are the chances that I took this picture of a volcanic island? And here I am talking about a volcanic island. <laughs> I just thought that's kind of funny. Okay, so let's move on to another mountain building event. Now you can see we've moved forward in time towards the present. Between 490, 440 million years ago or so, again, this is not exact. You can see what's listed on here is the Taconic Islands where the big yellow star is. Those are those volcanoes that were forming out in the middle of the Iapetus Ocean. So because of convergence, again, we're talking about orogeny, mountain building event, which means plates move towards each other. These islands were on a collision course with Laurentia. So they were carrying all their volcanic rocks and sediment, and they're basically acting like a big bulldozer. They're moving their way towards Laurentia. They're picking up ocean sediments and rocks on the ocean floor, and they're bringing all of this to Laurentia. Laurentia gets crunched again. It gets compressed and squeezed because of this plate convergence. Again, we had another mountain building event. Um, this would have created the, like, the ancestral Appalachian Mountains. And I just wanted to point out that I'm a Yankee. I'm from the North. I say Appalachian. So I know there's some debate that goes on with that, but that's how I say it. <laughs> but anyway, these um, kind of ancient ancestral Appalachian Mountains would have been about 15,000 feet tall. So again, North Carolina is in this zone where there's super tall mountains, you know, covered in ice and glaciers. And so um, and one thing I wanted to point out is that you can see where the equator is. We're south of the equator. Um, we spent a good portion, uh, Laurentia did, of its history in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, and, and so, you know, when we talked about the processes of carbon cycling and rock cycling and, and climate, um, you know, having all the continents in one hemisphere, that, that plays a big role in those, those processes and those cycles. Okay, finally, let's get to the big one, folks, the Allegheny and Orogeny. So now we're talking about 330 roughly to about 300 million years ago. This was the big one. This is this is how North Carolina finally came to be. So we had, you know, we had Rodinia that came together and it went apart. We had Calm, you know, we had some other, you know, um, compression events and convergence events. But this is the big one. So you can see, again, the star on your screen, which is proto first generation North Carolina, we are right there in the middle of those mountains. You can see that there's some white over top. White signifies snow and ice. You can also see we're still near uh, below the equator. So we're in the Southern hemisphere still. But Gondwana, look how big the text is. That means it's big. This is a big continent. Gondwana was a big monster. It was residing near the South Pole. It's Con it, it has some crust of Africa, uh, south of Antarctica. I mean, this was a big, big continent. And it was headed right for the Laurentia. It was coming for us. So we had those volcanoes collide with Laurentia. And now all of a sudden, not long after, we have Gondwana coming our way as well. So this, this creates the final phase of the Appalachian Mountains. So at the time, these mountains, our current Appalachian Mountains were like, 20,000 feet high. I mean, that to me, that's insane that we had mountains that were, you know, this tall, but talk about crunching. <laughs> I mean, this was a huge compression. And what happened when Gondwana hit us, uh, and we're going to talk about this in several of our, um, our geologic features that we visit today. It shoved rocks, like huge slabs of rocks, miles thick. It shoved them up onto Laurentia. It deformed them. It melted them. There was so much heat and so much pressure happening during this, this converging event that, um, you know, it basically forever changed Laurentia. And it was really what completed the formation of, of North America and North Carolina. And so when we talked about convergence before and one of the outcomes could be Supercontinent. Well, this created another supercontinent. This is Pangaea. Every I think 
nearly everybody's heard of Pangaea. This is the most recent supercontinent that we've had. Um, but it was really all because of that collision with Laurentia and Gondwana. And there was a few other places that was happening as well. But you can see the yellow star where North Carolina is. We're, we're basically in the heart of Pangaea, right in the middle. And you can see we're in a mountain belt. So there's no more white. So now at this time, those mountains are starting to erode and get a little bit smaller. But um, yeah, this is what Earth looked like. And imagine having all your continents really you know, in one place, look at how much open ocean there is and what that can do to climate cycles and carbon cycles. And, um, and it's kind of crazy. The other thing I point out here is um, Antarctica. Look at Antarctica. It was not frozen. Uh, and it had mountains. Look how many mountains are in, in our Antarctica during this time. Pretty crazy. Okay, so just like Rodinia, what happened to Pangaea? Well, it broke up. It wasn't anybody's fault. It just broke up. <laughs> bad, bad geography. Geology joke. <laughs> um, but anyway, so about 200, 220 million years ago, active rifting was happening again. Right? Are being pushed to the east. So we don't feel it, but we are still moving. Um, tectonic plates happening um, while this was rifting is that there were those failed rifts that were happening along the eastern coast of what would be North America. So we had the main rift that completely split became the Atlantic Ocean. And then we had all these failed rifts along the East Coast and actually over in Africa as well. Uh, we actually have one of these failed rift basins here um, on our doorstep in Durham. And we this was a place where, you know, rivers and streams were bringing sediment. And um, it was a pretty cool place. If you ever had the time, I'd love to talk to you about that one too, because um, our Triassic Basin there is pretty spectacular. So now that we know kind of the history and the story of North Carolina, like how we got here, some of these landforms are going to make a lot more sense to you. And hopefully that dog that I showed you playing the accordion makes a little more sense as well, because we just got crunched and pulled and squeezed and crunched over and over again through, through geologic time. But it created some fantastic landforms that we're going to talk about today. And we're going to start with Grandfather Mountain. And I was having issues um, getting the notes on my screen. So I have notes on paper that I'm going to be referencing because I want to make sure that I get these numbers right. So Grandfather Mountain is in Avery County, and it's 5,964 feet tall. It's a pretty tall mountain. For a long time, it was actually thought to be the tallest mountain in North Carolina or even in the eastern U.S. 1794, a French botanist called Andre Michaud, he climbed it. And he was for sure. He thought, yep, I reached the highest peak in North, North America. He even wrote it in his journal. But then in the late 1830s, there was a bit of debate going on because um, Elijah Mitchell, the guy who took over the survey from um, Mr. Olmsted, he climbed Grandfather Mountain. He also climbed the mountain that would eventually be named after him, Mount Mitchell. And he actually found that Mount Mitchell was higher. So Grandfather Mountain lost its pseudo designation as the highest mountain in North Carolina. But, um, you know, there's a lot of history with Grandfather Mountain. There's um, stories of Daniel Boone coming here to hunt. Um, the famous environmentalist, John Muir, he spent some time here as well. So, um, you know, Grandfather Mountain isn't just pretty. It, it actually has a lot of ecology. And, and if you have a chance to visit, it's, you know, it's a great place to go for a day. So I wanted to show you a few um few views of, of Grandfather Mountain. If you've ever been there and you're driving up to the top, you might encounter the, the picture on your left here, which is called Split Rock. And Split Rock is is just, it's just that. <laughs> it's a split rock. There was probably a crack in the rock. Some water got in there, freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing. The crack got bigger. You can see there's some trees around. So the roots probably helped that as well. But eventually over time, this crack is just going to get big and this rock will just tumble over. But if you've been there and you see it, it's a big rock. So that rock is going to tumble. The picture on the right, I just thought it was pretty. My husband and I visited um, last year and it was a crisp fall morning and there was frost on the treetops. So it was just pretty view. Um, okay, so the, the road to the top didn't actually exist for quite a while. People used to have to climb to the top. But now, luckily, we have a road that we can, we can get up there. And if you're lucky enough to do that, you might actually see some of the rocks of Grandfather Mountain. So <clears throat> I'm point this out. This is Grandfather Mountain, this is the main type of rock I would say um, that Grandfather Mountain is made of. There's a few other types, but we're just going to focus on this one because we only have an hour today. This, this rock is started out as a conglomerate. A conglomerate is a sedimentary rock. You can see that there's pieces 
of bigger rocks in here in kind of like what geologists call a matrix. But you can see how different and different sizes and, and different colors these, these pieces of rocks are. That tells us, uh, oh, and they're rounded as well. Um, rounded pieces of rock tell us that these rocks were probably transported in a river or a stream over a long period of time because they're round. Their edges have been worn off. And in fact, this conglomerate was actually formed in a rift basin. <laughs> so if you remember, let's see, that very first um, uh, supercontinent Rodinia, when it was rifting apart, 750, 740 million years ago, and we had those failed rift basins. Well, rocks were coming into the rift basins and eventually over millions of years, they get buried deep inside the earth and they become a sedimentary rock, in this case, a conglomerate. But then, of course, you know, we had this, this Gondwana issue to, to deal with and Gondwana is, you know, was on a, basically had a laser focus on Laurentia and wanted to, to beat us up. So, you know, when we got squeezed by Gondwana during that last orogenic event, a lot of these rocks that existed in the um, rift basins got metamorphosed, which means they got changed. They weren't melted. They were heated a bit. They were put under pressure and um, just kind of changed form just a little bit. So these rocks, these metamorphosed sedimentary rocks are, they're old, <laughs> you know, they, they were, they're from Rodinia time. Um, but what happened at Grandfather Mountain in that kind of the area of Grandfather Mountain and Linville Falls, when Gondwana collided with us 300 or so million years ago, and remember I said it was like shoving rocks, thrusting rocks up onto Laurentia. Well, what happened, it was thrusting these old rocks up on top of these younger sedimentary rocks. And that usually doesn't happen. If you know a little bit of about geology, normally the oldest rocks are at the bottom. And as you move up in a sequence, the rocks get younger. But that's just the opposite is what's happening at Grandfather Mountain. We actually have old rocks on top of younger rocks. And that's all because of Gondwana colliding with ancient North America with Laurentia. It shoved these older rocks up on top. But the cool thing that happened was those older rocks were actually um, eroded away. And so they kind of left this geologic tectonic window for us to look down to see the younger rocks. So we're actually looking through older rocks to see younger rocks here at Grandfather Mountain, which is cool. So I wanted to include this picture. Of course, if you're familiar with Grandfather Mountain, you know the Mile High Bridge. It takes you over here to Linville Peak, which is 5,295 feet above sea level. Uh, I did cross the bridge when I was at Grandfather Mountain. Um, begrudgingly, I did. <laughs> um, I'm not afraid of heights. I always say I'm afraid of dying from heights. So, <laughs> But I did cross it. <laughs> um, and the cool thing about this peak they used to have hang gliding competitions here. So if you are from North Carolina and you grew up here, you might have heard about this. It was pretty famous. Um, they used to have hang gliding competitions here. Um, I, I watched a YouTube video of um, it might have been some App State students. I don't remember. But they anyway, they did a field trip here and there was a worker um, at Grandfather Mountain. And he had a story that no, actually, they were from Virginia Tech. And he said that the guy went off of the mountain in a hang glider and, and flew the whole way to, to Virginia. And I don't know if that's true. I've never been able to confirm that. But if you have any information on that, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> that was kind of a cool story. Okay, so that was our first stop, Grandfather Mountain. Let's move on to Linville Falls, which is not far down the road from Grandfather Mountain, just to the southwest. So Linville Falls, again, beautiful, but very cool geology here, too. We're going to talk about two different rocks, two different ages of rocks, and two different places here. We're going to first talk about the Upper Falls, which is up here. This is the Upper Falls, and then we're going to move on to the rocks down here, which is the Lower Falls. It's kind of a, um, a similar situation, but a bit different to Grandfather Falls, but we're going to talk about this. So we're going to start with the Upper Falls. Okay, the Upper Falls. They are about 75, 745 million years old, and they're metamorphosed granite. So I kind of tried to draw some images here to show you the textures or what these rocks look like. They're really blocky. And that's just a, um, 
that's how granite is. If you know anything about granite, it tends to form in these massive plutons underground. It's an igneous rock. It's, it's um, you know, melted rock that has solidified and it tends to be blocky. So I tried to show you on the screen what some of that blocky texture might look like. You also might recognize the age, 745 million years. We're going back to Rodinia again. So, you know, 745 million years old, pretty old rocks. But the interesting fact is this is the upper falls and we have the lower falls. The upper falls are older than the lower falls. Again, this is contradictory to geology because the younger rocks are supposed to be on top and the older rocks are supposed to be on the bottom, which is not the case here. The older rocks are on top. Well, we're gonna talk about how that happened and, and what was going on during that time. But you can see I've pointed out the lower uh, falls, the rocks of the lower falls, metamorphosed sandstone, which in geology speak, we call quartzite. It's 540 million years old. So let's take a closer look at those rocks. Okay, so again, we're looking at the rocks of the lower falls, which is much different than the rocks of the upper falls. You see the blockiness is gone. And that's because this is sandstone that got metamorphosed. So squished and squeezed and heated and didn't melt, but it kind of got pl like plastic. And um, you can see that there's a lot of layers here. You can also see that there's kind of, it's kind of wavy. And though that comes from two different processes. The layering is actually from when it was accumulating on a beach. Go back to that picture um, that I showed you of Laurentia just kind of hanging out on the beach during this calm period and nothing was happening and sand was accumulating. This is that sand. So 540 million years ago, you know, when we had this ocean called the Iapetus Ocean and Laurentia and the sand was accumulating on the beach. It's kind of the, you know, think of the Grand Canyon and how it has all those layers. This is what you're kind of looking at. There's no iron here to, to change it red, but it's the, it's the same process. The waviness came about because of Gondwana yet again. Um, he keeps coming up. Um, so these rocks, th this sandstone again on the shores of Laurentia got buried over millions of years, it became sandstone, a sedimentary rock. And then during that final orogenic event, when Gondwana collided with us, it metamorphosed it into this rock we know as quartzite. Quartzite is very resistant to weathering. It's a very hard rock because quartz in itself is a very hard mineral. So quartzite and sandstone, there it's a very hard rock. But the same thing that we just talked about at Grandfather Mountain, we had this, um, you know, big event when Gondwana collided collided with us and it, these rocks in this area were thrust over top of the sandstone. So the sandstone during this thrusting event got metamorphosed into what we see today. But the older rocks, those 745 million year old granites that we just saw are now residing on top of these younger rocks. But the, the metamorphosed granite is a little easier to weather and erode away. So it goes away. And then we're left again with this tectonic window, this geologic window where we can see the younger rocks beneath it. And so I included this picture here. Okay. So there's a story here. So uh, obviously I do education and outreach. So um, I talk a lot. Um, I have an opinion about everything. I'm not shy to share my opinions or talk. Um, however, when my husband and I visited here, this is the Linville Gorge, which is just downstream from Linville Falls. I was actually speechless for about 30 seconds, which does not happen often to me. It took my breath away. This is, it was amazing. And, it, you know, it was October. So, of course, the leaves had changed colors and, and it was just beautiful. So, if you ever visit Linville Falls, just go down the road a bit and check out the gorge because it is just as spectacular. And if you've ever had one of those spots that you visited and you don't want to share it with anybody because you kind of want to keep it to yourself, that's the spot for me. <laughs> if you email me, I'll tell you where I got this picture from, but I'm not going to tell everybody because I want to keep it to myself. <laughs> okay, let's move now a little northeast and let's head to Pilot Mountain. So if you are familiar at all with North Carolina, you are familiar with Pilot Mountain because it stands out. It is this crazy looking mountain in the middle of the Piedmont. It's got vertical sides that don't have a lot of vegetation. It's kind of flat on the top. Most people do think it's a volcano. It is not a volcano. We'll find that out here in a minute. Again, I'm going to go back to the elevation so I get it right. It's 2,421 feet 
in elevation. And so it's about 1,500 feet higher than the surrounding Piedmont, which averages about 800 feet above sea level. So it really stands out. Um, it's on the western edge of this tiny little mountainous area called the Saraton Mountains. It's just north of Winston-Salem. And if you ever look at a, um, even go to Google Maps and put it on the terrain feature, you're going to see just north of Winston-Salem, this tiny little area of these mountains that kind of stand out They're, you know, they definitely stand out from the surrounding Piedmont. And we actually have a name for mountains that are like that. And it's a tongue twister. I'm going to say it. It's called a monadnock. That's quite a word, right? <laughs> monadnock. A monadnock is a mountain that kind of stands out alone um, and is really separate from the surrounding lowlands. So those Saraton Mountains and Pilot Mountain, which is like kind of on the western fringe, those are called monadnocks. Um, but they are part of a, a small, small little mountain chain. So how did Pilot Mountain form? This has an interesting story as well. So I took this picture. I'm on the small pinnacle and I'm looking east at the big pinnacle and out towards the other Manadnocks in the Saraton Mountains, um, Hanging Rock and a few other um, areas to the east. Okay, so we're going to go back again and talk about that sand that was accumulating on the shores of La Rentia 540 or so million years ago, those same that same sand formation that formed the quartzite at Linville Falls is the same quartzite here at Pilot Mountain. So, you know, the, the shore of Laurentia was large, just like, you know, the shore of North America today. It's, it's, it's not small. There's, so there was a lot of sand that accumulated. There was a lot of um, um, sandstone sedimentary rocks that were formed. So, you know, it just kind of makes sense that, you know, we have a lot of the same rocks repeating in North Carolina. And so again, this sandstone got buried, you know, and over time it got more competent. And then when Gondwana collided with us, uh, you know, we've talked about this before, it should, should sound familiar by now, um, that sandstone got metamorphosed um, into quartzite, which again, as we talked about, is pretty resistant to weathering and erosion. So this is why we have these monadnocks, these mountains. So the the rocks of the surrounding area were more easily weathered. And so they have eroded away um, and we're left with these pinnacles. Now it's not, you know, it's like when you buy a coat that says weather resistant or weatherproof, there's a difference. So um, quartzite will eventually erode. It just is gonna take longer than, you know, maybe volcanic rocks. So eventually this will erode, but you know, it just it's just gonna take a little bit longer. So I wanted to show this because those Saraton Mountains, those Monadnocks, they have a, an interesting feature. So when Gondwana collided with us or when there's any sort of plate collisions, convergence coming together, um, you know, we say mountains get built because the rocks get pushed up. Um, the other thing that can happen is the rocks can crumple like a rug. And when I go into a classroom, fourth and sixth graders, you know, we talk a lot about rocks. And I said, did you know that rocks can bend? And they're always, no, rocks can't be bent. Rocks can't be bent. Well, rocks can be bent. And I showed them a picture like this. Um, so rocks can get heated just enough that they kind of become plasticky or, you know, kind of like silly putty and they might not melt and they might not break, but you can bend rocks if with enough pressure. And so when Gondwana was colliding with us during that last continental collision, um, you know, we had rocks that were being thrust up onto the continent, but then we also had rocks that were kind of crumpling like a rug. You know, you can imagine if you push a rug together, you have those peaks and valleys. And what I'm showing you on my screen, this is a very small scale. So imagine this over, you know, a large area. This is what the ground underneath those Saraton Mountains would look like. And Pilot Mountain would actually res um, res resides kind of like at the top of one of these anticline formation. So you can think of that like an A, it kind of resembles an A, anticline. Um, and so the rocks of Pilot Mountain are kind of horizontal because they reside at like the axis of one of these folds. Okay, so I'm going to continue with Pilot Mountain because I love Pilot Mountain. Um, it's such a cool place. Um, these are some of the close-up rocks of, of Pilot Mountain. So imagine again, these are rocks that began as sand on the beach. And you can see a few features here in this close-up picture. You can see that there's some, what we call cross bedding. You can kind of see maybe that the sand was accumulating at different angles and that would have been because of wind and waves. 
So that to a geologist is a key indicator that this formed in a near shore environment or like a shallow beach area. The other thing that you'll see in this picture is dark spots and specifically here and down here. So what are the dark spots? Well, it's heavy minerals. Ilmenite, possibly, which is like a titanium oxide. It could be magnetite, which is an iron oxide. Um, so imagine, remember, these were deposited, the sand was deposited on a beach. So if you go to a beach today, you know, on our, on our coast here, sometimes when you're walking, you might see those streaks of dark sand um, on the beach. That's what you're looking at here. This is just an accumulation of heavy minerals. Um, and they tend to, you know, settle because they're a little bit heavier than the surrounding sand. So I did break one of the, the cardinal rules of geology by showing this picture. I didn't give you guys a scale. So as a geologist, we are taught and trained to put a scale on our picture. So what are you looking at? Is this feet thick? Is it inches thick? What is it? So there you go. There's me for scale. Um, so that's what we were looking at was just one of those tiny little layers in there. So um, I show this because, you know, this is obviously Pilot Mountain. Look how beautiful it is. But the picture on the right, I mean, these are layers of sand and that became rock that accumulated on a beach 540 million years ago on a continent that no longer exists, um, near an ocean that no longer exists. And you can touch it. That to me is what is so fascinating about geology. You can touch something that's 540 million years old. I mean, what other profession gets to do that? Well, I'm sure there's paleontologists that get to do that, but I mean, it, I don't know. I find it fascinating. Okay, so um, my husband and I moved to North Carolina in 2021, and Pilot Mountain was, I think, the like the first place that we went to when we, you know, decided to venture out and explore. And it was not long after our visit that it caught on fire, and I was kind of devastated. Uh, the, the media showed images of this raging orange fire at night, and it was like an inferno, but it actually wasn't that bad. Um, I just wanted to point this out because they do prescribed burns here at Pilot Mountain. They've been doing it, I think, since 2003. And so there was not a whole lot of fuel on the mountain, so this this fire could have been a lot worse. And, and in fact, it was... Um, it was due for prescribed burn anyway. So this this fire just kind of helped it out. And um, it was started by a campfire in an undesignated area. So, you know, don't do that. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to move to the coast. This is our final stop in our tour today. We're going to head to the Outer Banks. <clears throat> what are the Outer Banks? Well, in very technical geologic terms, they are barrier islands, which are just piles of sand. <laughs> I mean, you can't get much more technical than that. But honestly, that's what they are. They are piles of sand that accumulated along our coast. And so they have beaches, they have inlets, there's washover deposits, which we're going to talk about. It's pretty critical. Um, we have sounds and estuaries and dunes and capes and all these terms that we like to use, but um, they're, they're beautiful as well. I mean, on top of all of that. So how exactly did they form? Okay, so Everything that we've been talking about up to this point has been in the millions to billions of years age time range. Well, we're going to move way towards the present time now. We're going to talk about the last glacial period. So 20,000 years ago, I'm being very general here. Um, during that time, during the last glacial period, uh, the sea levels were much, much lower than they are, like 400 feet lower than they are today. And so you could have walked, if, if North Carolina existed, you could have walked 30 miles out into what is now the ocean, out onto the continental shelf. And so our continent, that Laurentia, Laurentia actually stopped about 30 miles further out. And so just like on a beach today, you would have had dunes, you would have had sand accumulating into dunes. Um, <clears throat> and so that's probably how the Outer Banks started. They were dunes on this ancient continent that no longer exists um, in an ancient ocean that no longer exists. But as that glacial period started to end and sea levels were rising because the ice was melting, those dunes probably got submerged to become sandbars. And, um, you know, the sandbars got submerged. We had tides coming in from the east, keeping them covered in water, um, you know, so the, the, there was probably a lot happening at that time, but that's probably the general idea of how the these outer banks were. Okay, so fast forward a bit. The ice age is ending. 
the ice caps, the glaciers are melting, sea level is rising just a bit. And um, those dunes probably got submerged to become sandbars. And there's actually, um, you know, we like to think of the Outer Banks, the beaches as just water and sand, but actually underneath all that sand is the same rocks that we have like in the Piedmont because, you know, this was part of our continent. It has just now been covered by sediment from those eroding Appalachian Mountains. And so over time, sea level is rising, the dunes get submerged, um, you know, become sandbars. But then we have, um, let's see, after thousands of years, these things would have grown, they would have gotten bigger. We have tides coming in, we have winter winds from the Northeast, we have summer winds from the Southwest. And then eventually enough sand would accumulate from the geology underneath. We have enough sediment coming from the geologic features underneath the ocean that there's enough sand these sandbars grew and eventually they become barrier islands. Well, once they, you know, kind of broke the surface of the ocean, rain comes down. So rain washes away the salt. Things like, you know, um, sea oats and other trees and shrubs can take hold. And before you know it, we have these things called the Outer Banks or there are barrier islands. They're still active. They're still moving. They're still migrating. So let's look at one area specifically, Jockey's Ridge State Park. It's near Nags Head. It's just a few miles south of where the Wright brothers made their historic flight back in 1903. Okay, Jockey's Ridge State Park, it's the largest active sand dune on the East Coast. And it's active because it's still moving, um, it's still migrating, and you can see how big it is. I mean, wow, it's, it's, it's a huge place. I've not been there yet. I've kind of been all around that area into Nags Head, but I've not been here. So I don't have any pictures of myself there, unfortunately. At some times, this dune has been 80 to 100 feet tall, so it's it's pretty big. But it's a special kind of dune called a Madano. 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 Sorry. Madano, I think. Madano is kind of like a Manadnock. It's it's the Manadnock of dunes, I guess. Um, it has to be isolated. It's steep, has steep sides. It's usually relatively unvegetated. Um, and it's, you know, stands alone. It's tall. So it is kind of like a Manadnock, which is interesting. But there are two key factors um, in forming this type of dune. You have to have lots and lots of sand, which we have here, and you have to have lots of wind from opposing directions. Uh, we have that too. It's kind of crazy. We have these um, summer winds that come from the Southwest for the most part. In the winter, we have winds from the Northeast. So they're opposing. The winds from the Northeast in the winter tend to be a little bit stronger. So. Um, over time, the dune is migrating to the southwest just a bit, like one to six feet a year. But that really all depends on um, storms and, you know, what type of wind we get during the winter. But, it, you know, it doesn't it's isolated. You can see that some of these pictures, there's almost nothing on it. There's a few sea oats here and there. But um, again, it's such a tall dune that you can hang glide off of it. And but it's not you might think or you might question why isn't it just blowing away? If it's that tall and we have so much wind, why isn't it just gone? Why doesn't it just blow away? Well, you know, the, the main reason is because it's wet. The, the surface is dry, but if you've ever dug even a foot into sand, it's wet. And if you've ever tried to move wet sand, you know that you can, it's heavy. And so this dune really isn't gonna blow away or, you know, or even blow anywhere. So it's just migrating very, very slowly. And I just wanted to show you here, this is, this is kind of how dunes migrate. So there's, you have little pieces of sand, the lighter stuff that can be blown away. And that's what usually gets in your face when you're at the beach and the wind is blowing, it's hitting you. It's the smaller pieces. The larger pieces are a little bit too big and too heavy to be blown away. And so when you have a prevailing wind, in this instance, wind moving this way, it picks up those little particles and then it, it deposits them. So it erodes it and it deposits it deposits it on a thing called a slip face. And over time, you can see how this process might help the, the dune to migrate. So that's why we have migrating dunes. Um, so I think I'm gonna check my time. I did good, <laughs> I went a little long, but I just wanna thank you guys for listening today. Um, I had so much fun researching this. I actually do a tour like this in downtown Raleigh. So if you're interested in learning about the rocks of downtown Raleigh, I'd be I'd love to, to take you on an, another tour. But, and if you have any suggestions, I was thinking for a future event like this, um, new places, I'd love to do the research and, and do something again like this. So thank you all. And thanks for inviting me to do this. And thanks for listening.
Back Amy, to you, Chris. thank you so much. <laughs> uh, amazing stuff. Everybody, great big round of applause for Amy. So much. Okay, so much fun. Um, so much information, too. <laughs> so, yeah, so much information. <laughs> Uh, but I love learning stuff about like Grandfather Mountain and Pilot Mountain and the and the Outer Banks, uh, some of which like we've we've gotten on this program before. But like these deep dives and really like getting the like billion year history of North Carolina. Ah. That's really incredible stuff. So uh, we do have a few minutes left in the show. So there's some time yeah. for questions if you're <laughs> okay. ready for them. Sure. Go ahead. All right. First off. Oh well, first off, here somebody said that your downtown tour is fantastic. Oh, so thanks. I'm I'm gonna look for the sign up for that one. <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, here's a good question: How do geologists determine the geologic time frames for these events, like the or orogenies, and how confident are geologists in the estimates? Yeah, you said you know, they debate like, amongst themselves, yeah. but. I actually had a slide, a few slides that explained this, but I knew I was running long, so I nixed those slides. So I, but without fail, I always get what kind of survey are you doing and how do you really know how old these rocks are? And so there's a few ways we have something called um, radiometric dating. So most rocks have, uh, some rocks I should say, have uh, minerals that are radioactive and they decay. And so we might have like potassium and argon. Um, uranium to lead. And so we can actually take, you know, science information and, and look at the decay rates to figure out, we can go back in time then and figure out how old something is. There's another way um, called relative dating. And so that's kind of what I was explaining a bit when I was saying older rocks on the bottom, younger rocks on the top. So um, we can maybe take a, a bit of rock that we can get an absolute date by doing that radiometric dating. And then um, put it in its sequential order or figure out, you know, is it on top of this rock? So it might be younger or is it below this rock? So it might be older than that one. So there's a couple different ways we can do it. All right. Excellent stuff. Uh, let's see here. I, I got to the idea to me that you can, you can like take a rock sample, you submit it to a few tests and then I guess researchers and geologists have worked out half lives and decay rates of something of yeah. specific minerals. And so you can, yeah. I guess we've known for a long time how to do those sorts of things in order to get, to do it over and over and over again, to get at accurate yeah. ages yes. for these sorts but, of things. Yeah. But then, you know, like North Carolina, you throw in that aspect of, well, we've had these massive collisions where older rocks have now been pushed on top of younger rocks or they've been, deformed and melted and and you know so there's this whole other aspect it's not it's not as straightforward probably as I've just made it out to be it's a you know pretty especially in a place like North Carolina it's pretty complicated and thankfully we do have experts that do that <laughs> I am not one right <laughs> <laughs> and so uh what do you feel like are the like when you're going around and you're talking about geology with uh, people in the public and with classrooms uh, maybe besides, you know, did you know that rocks can bend? What are some of the things that fascinate people the most about uh, geologic processes? Um, because I feel know, like they're hard to grasp. They're hard to because grasp. Because of the time scales. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and when you say geology, people tend to think of it as just identifying rocks and minerals. Yeah. That's and quartzite. So, that's granite. I know. I know. That is the very first thing. Oh, you deal with rocks. Well, mm -hmm. yes. But um, I think... One of the things that I try to emphasize is that geology and earth science is so much more than rocks and minerals. It is these processes. And those processes also include water. You know, we have groundwater that we have to deal with and surface water. We have hazards like, you know, landslides. And we have um, some naturally occurring stuff that happens in water and rocks like arsenic and radon that geologists are involved with. Um, we have to deal with you know, one of the biggest things that I like to um, to talk to people about is actually climate change and how geology is involved with that. Because, you know, we we are the kind of the the profession that that finds elements for concrete and cement, you know, and that is one of the biggest contributors to climate change. So geologists are involved with everyday things. And I think the other thing um, besides just how um, 
how these processes give us all these resources that we need is that how many different types of professions there are that that involve geology, mining, um, po- you know, pollution and contamination. We have hydrogeologists. We have um, economic geologists. We have so many different. We have education geologists like me. So. Um, if you are have even a bit of interest in rocks and minerals, there are so many facets out there that you can kind of, you know, include geology in and not just be that rock, rock geologist. Fascinating stuff. Excellent. And I guess I'm curious too, like if you go on a vacation or if you're just driving around town, do you ever see or like, do you notice geology when you're at places that you find fascinating or interesting where does where does your geology knowledge just like uh, uh this is a bad word but like intrude into your daily life like you're okay, sitting like so, you showed us a yeah. picture you're sitting on the beach in Antigua there's a volcano in the distance and you're like oh I wonder if that oh. thing's headed this way in 500 million years yeah and I'll tell my husband oh did you know that that's a well, sure whatever you know and he rolls his eyes <laughs> uh, no you know I am I'm not a rock and mineral geologist. I was trained as a hydrogeologist, so I, I've dealt with water. But honestly, I should have been a geomorphologist because I am fascinated by the processes. So when I see a rock that you know was deposited in a flat horizontal layer and it's angled like this, how it got there is fascinating to me. So I will stop and look at that and try to figure out because, you know, the, the type of rocks that are there, yeah, okay, that's cool. But how did it get to, how did it get almost vertical? what is the pressure and the the forces that had to make that happen to me that's fascinating so yeah i will always stop and look at that and then i of course get on my phone and i research it and and it usually ends up in a presentation like this (laughs) (laughs) because i find it fascinating and i hope other people do too (laughs) uh one of our viewers with the username second rate baker wrote uh yes you do do that I don't. I guess that's my uh, best friend. <laughs> that's that's a colleague. That's I a colleague, your friend, family. Then <laughs> excellent stuff. Glad they're tuning in too. Okay, uh, one popped in for you. It's uh, yes or no, and then we're gonna get out of here and let people get back to their work days and yes. school days. Uh, is there any gold in North Carolina? There is gold in North Carolina. There is no longer big deposits of gold. Most of it is now tiny little pieces that you'll find in a stream. Um, and so there are places around, um, you know, the Charlotte area where you can go and pan for gold. So, yeah, there's still gold here for sure. I love it. There's always some interesting <laughs> stuff. Yeah. Good luck to you. There's always more to to see, do and learn about. Oh, my gosh. I could Carolina. do 10 of these and we wouldn't cover half of North Carolina. So. Well, Thanks Amy, we're definitely going to have you back on the program because this was a lot of fun. And I know we all learned a lot. Uh, viewers, thank you for tuning in to this edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Uh, we will be back here, of course, next Wednesday with another program for you. Head to eenorthcarolina.org. That's the website for the Office of Environmental Education. There you can see the schedule for upcoming events, and you can sign up for the email newsletter. That way you get the YouTube link in your inbox every Wednesday morning. All you got to do is come click and join us every single week. And of course, you can follow us all on social media at Natural Sciences at North Carolina EE. And Amy, do you know the US uh, NCGS handles if people wanted to keep up with the geological survey, see what's going on there? Yeah, it's deq.nc.gov slash geological dash survey. It's a pretty short one. We shortened it. (laughs) Excellent stuff. All right, everybody. Uh, Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Bye.